Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Hope you all enjoyed your nice lunch break. Had some good Chipotle. Um, my name is Ben Pierce, and I'm an officer for CSSA. Today, it is my honor to introduce Donald Hoffman, who works as a professor and researcher at University of California, Irvine. There, his research focuses on visual perception, evolutionary psychology, consciousness, and artificial intelligence to reveal the unknowns of human perception and reality. Through his work, Professor Hoffman has received distinguished awards such as the Trolland Research Award from the National Academy of Sciences and Distinguished Scientific Award from American Psychological Association. Please, let's give a warm welcome to Professor Hoffman as he begins his presentation entitled The Case Against Reality. Thank you very much, Ben. It's a pleasure to be here. Let's see if I can move to the next slide. Hmm. Okay. We perceive a world of objects in space-time. For example, we, we see this deer, we see trees, we see fog, we see the sun, and we even see our own bodies as objects in space-time. Science for centuries now has had an ontology in which space-time and its objects are fundamental. So space-time began about 13.8 billion years ago in the Big Bang and uh, gradually got more and more complicated as it got cooler and evolved into the objects that we see and even the organisms and, and life that we see today. So science has had this ontology of physical objects in space-time as being fundamental reality. And in addition to this ontology, science has had a methodology of reductionism that comes from the space-time ontology. The idea is that as you go to smaller and smaller scales in space and time, you will find more and more fundamental laws of nature. When we get to the, the smallest scales that we've probed so far, we find things like quarks and leptons and, and, and bosons. So these are the most fundamental kinds of particles in, in this ontology. Um, as we go up, uh, these particles assemble into bigger objects um, like pyramidal neurons in the brain. And as we continue to go up in scale, those, those pyramidal neurons and all, all kinds of neurons and glial cells and so forth uh, assemble into even more complicated objects such as the brain. So, so these have been spectacularly successful assumptions of science, the ontology of space-time and the methodology of reductionism. Uh, and much of our scientific progress uh, in the last few centuries has been a result of these wonderful methodologies. When you look at your face in the mirror, uh, you do see an object in space-time, but you know that the object that you see, for example, your face in the mirror, um, is, is not all that there is to you. You know firsthand that you have conscious experiences, a headache, um, the experiences of colors and shapes and motions, uh, sensory uh, tactile experiences and so forth. So in some sense, you know that, or it seems like in addition to your physical body in space time, you have also something else, your, your conscious experiences. When we look at a, a cat, we suspect that in addition to its physical body, it also has conscious experiences, but uh, we have less insight into those conscious experiences. With a mouse, um, we have even less insight into what those conscious experiences might be. When we get down to microbes, um, we have no clue if they even have conscious experiences. And when we get down to things like rocks, um, we're pretty convinced that we're dealing with things that uh, have no conscious experiences at all that aren't even alive. When it comes to artificial intelligences, uh, our intuitions about whether they're conscious or not seem to vary from person to person. For some people, it seems like if the AI is complicated enough in the right ways, it, it, may, it may somehow give rise to consciousness. The, the circuits and software that would otherwise be uh, lifeless and without consciousness, if they have the right complexity, the right function, then perhaps they might um, generate consciousness. So the idea about consciousness is that space-time is fundamental, objects in space-time are fundamental, 
And in, in the case of consciousness, um, probably brain activity or embodied brain activity. So the, the brain inside your body in a perception, decision, action loop with the environment somehow gives rise to our conscious experiences. And so this is, well, this, this framing of the problem is um, within the tradition of science for centuries, the ontology of, of objects in space-time and the methodology of reductionism. Once we understand um, the, the parts of the brain and how they operate, then or, or the body more generally, we might be able to generate a, a theory of consciousness and see how consciousness arises. And, uh, you know, just a couple of quotes on this. So a, a professor there at UC Berkeley, a, a professor of philosophy, John Searle, says the brain is a machine, it's a conscious machine. So of course, some machines can think and be conscious, your brain and mind, for example. So yeah, the, the brain is a carbon-based machine. So nothing special about carbon. Presumably, if we have the right kind of complexity in a silicon-based machine, an AI could be conscious as well. So, so the hope is that somehow we can start with an understanding of physical systems and objects in space-time, use the methodology of reductionism to figure out how we might boot up consciousness. Um, let me go back one if I can. Right, okay. David Chalmers, another uh, professor of philosophy, says that in, in one of his books, implementing the right computation suffices for rich conscious experiences like our own. So once we get the right functional software in a, in a system or in our brains, then that can uh, lead to the emergence of consciousness. And if we understand that software, if we understand how physical systems with the right complexity can generate our conscious experiences, we should be able to figure out that, you know, that function, that program, and perhaps download it and download our consciousness and maybe even have immortality, some of, of thought. So we could download our software that generates our consciousness and have immortality. So our, our rich world of, of conscious experiences, such like this rich experience of color that you might be having right now, is from this, this framework of the ontology of physicalism, the methodology of reductionism, to be this, this rich experience is to be explained as the result of some complicated function of physical objects in space-time. And some of the evidence, there's, there's lots of evidence uh, offered for this kind of point of view about consciousness. I'll just mention one interesting one. It's something called hemiachromatopsia. If you have a, a stroke in area V4 of, of visual cortex in your left hemisphere, uh, you'll have this weird situation in which the right visual field appears only in shades of gray, but the left visual field is in full color. And you can also experience this if you have a, a transcranial magnetic stimulation device. If you take that device and, and touch it to your scalp near area V4, say in the left hemisphere um, of your brain, then when you inhibit V4, you will experience the color draining out of the right visual field. And when you turn off the magnet, then you will experience the color coming back into your visual field. So these, this is just one of many examples of so-called neural correlates of conscious experience. And the, these neural correlates are the sort of the, what we're looking for there are these minimal um, circuits or functions of the brain that are you know, sort of necessary and sufficient for specific um, conscious experiences. So we have all these correlations, but of course, uh, correlations are not a theory and correlations do not imply causation. The rooster crows every morning uh, at sunrise. In fact, the rooster crow typically is a little bit before sunrise, but none of us thinks that that correlation enta entails causation. The, the rooster crow does not cause the sun to rise. And so the, the neural correlates of conscious experience that, that we have, and there are many of them, there's wonderful research on this, um, are not a theory of consciousness. They're the data that a theory of consciousness needs to explain. And right now, it's, um, it's been pretty tough. Uh, the, the ontology of space, time, and objects and the methodology of reductionism has been spectacularly successful in almost every other area of science. But when it comes to consciousness, uh, it's been spectacularly unsuccessful. Um, we have many brilliant 
uh, researchers working on this problem. And with a number of theories, there's a, the idea that maybe um, working memory somehow is, is critical for conscious experience. And if you have the right kind of connection of, of circuits in the brain that are involved in working memory to the rest of the brain activity, you might have some kind of emergence of conscious experiences, the global workspace theory. There's integrated information theory. If you have the right kind of integration of the, of the computational system, uh, so-called you know, quantity of phi is high enough, then you could have um, conscious experience. There's theories in which uh, orchestrated collapse of quantum states in certain neuronal micro microtubules are, are proposed to um, cause conscious experiences. And then there are others uh, like Dan Dennett and um, Keith Frankish who basically say consciousness uh, is just an illusion. You know, you know space-time and objects are fundamental. That's all there is. And our belief that we have conscious experiences is just a user illusion. So, but the, the, the state of play is, well, for, for, I'll just put it here with, with Pinker. Pinker suggests that he likes the global workspace idea. He says consciousness consists of a global workspace representing our current goals, memories, and surroundings. But, but after he's looked at all the research that's been done in trying to explain this, he says, but this last dollop in the theory that it subjectively feels like something to be such circuitry may have to be stipulated as a fact about reality where explanation stops. And, and, and the reason why, why Pinker is saying we may have to just stipulate this and, and explanation stops is because in fact, um, none of the theories that I proposed and, and no theory proposed so far has been able to explain even one specific conscious experience. Right. You might be interested in say what it's like to have the taste of chocolate. That's a specific constant experience or to smell a potato or to smell a rose or to see a rose or to hear the, you know, the sound of a saxophone. So there, there are many, many specific conscious experiences that you might ask for these, these theories of consciousness to explain. But the remarkable fact is this. After decades of research and in dozens, perhaps hundreds of neural correlates of consciousness that have been found, there is not a single specific conscious experience that can be explained. So for example, there, you know, say the, the color green, I would want in the case of integrated information theory for it to say what specific pattern of integrated information must be green 54. Why is it that that pattern must be green 54 and it could not be green 52? I would like to have that kind of specific from a scientific theory or, you know, in the case of the global neuronal workspace, what precise architecture of working memory and, and activity in that working memory is required to be exactly the sound of a middle C on the saxophone. And why is it that that's, that, that precise neuronal activity could not be a, a, an E or, or a, a B sharp or something like that. So, that's what I mean when I say I would like a theory to explain a specific conscious experience. And the remarkable fact is there is not a single theory that starts with physical systems, say brains or silicon circuits, and that can explain without hand wave any one specific conscious experience. So the ontology of space time and objects in space time the methodology of reductionism has been spectacularly successful so far, but in the problem of consciousness, we have yet to put a single point on the board in the sense of even explaining one specific conscious experience. And that's a remarkable failure. And so this might cause us to step back and ask, you know, maybe we just haven't worked hard enough. What's going on here? And what I want to propose is what the physicists have now been telling us for about 20 or 30 years. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's a shock, but the physicists have been saying that the ontology of space-time and of objects in space-time, which has been the foundation of science for centuries, is over. Space-time is doomed. There are good reasons to believe, and I'll discuss a couple, that space-time cannot be fundamental. Something deeper than space-time has to be sought in our physics and in our science, and space-time has to emerge from that. So space-time is doomed, and, and that's not me saying that, that's physicists. So if you Google space-time is doomed, you'll find work by physicists like Nima Arkani Hamed um, and Juan Maldesena and others, um, where they're explicitly 
I'm not just saying space time is doomed, their research is actively going and has for decades now been looking for the structures beyond space time, things like cosmological polytopes and amplitudehedra. So, so space time is doomed. And I'll just explain just briefly one of the arguments that the physicists give for why it's doomed and why they've given up on space time. So if you're, tr if you're trying to do the reductionist thing, you're trying to look at space at smaller and smaller scales, what you need uh, to resolve smaller and smaller scales is light with smaller and smaller wavelengths to resolve the smaller details. And qu quantum theory tells us that as you go to smaller and smaller um, wavelengths of light, the energy of the light gets larger and larger. And in a world without gravity, that would be no problem. But in a world with gravity, you have the problem that, as Einstein told us, energy and mass are equivalent. And so as you get more and more energy into a smaller and smaller region of space, eventually you get so much mass energy in that region of space that you create a black hole. And the object that you're trying to measure, um, say you're trying to measure the spin of an electron, well, the, the electron disappears into a black hole. So you destroy the very object that you're trying to, to observe. And there are other reasons. The measuring apparatus itself in quantum theory is a physical system with degrees of freedom. So if you have a, a room um, that you're trying to measure some like spin of electron or some other properties. So you, if you want to get more and more precision, you have to have more and more degrees of freedom in your measuring apparatus. And as that gets more and more degrees of freedom, eventually the measuring apparatus becomes so heavy that it creates a black hole. So so quantum theory by itself would be fine with uh, infinite resolution, but when you have gravity, um, gravity is the, the spoils part. It, it, it spoils the party and it destroys space time. Space time is no longer fundamental and we know precisely where. At 10 to the minus 33 centimeters and 10 to the minus 43 seconds, space time ceases to make sense. So it's not like there are pixels of space time. It's just that the whole conceptual framework of space time falls apart. And, and that's not very deep, 10 to the minus 33 centimeters, not, te not terribly deep from my point of view. If it was 10 to the minus 33 trillion centimeters, I'd say that was pretty impressive work on the part of space time, but 10 to the minus 33 isn't that deep. So space time has had a good ride, but it's over. Space time is doomed and the, the best and brightest uh, of the new generation of physicists are now looking for new structures beyond space time uh, and they're succeeding. They're, they're actually finding things um, but they're saying, you know, space time is doomed and reductionism is dead. So, and, and this for, for us in the neurosciences, this is, um, this is sort of shocking news. We, we have been good um, space time physicalists and, and, and reductionists because in, in part, because the physicists have told us that this is the way to go. And now the physicists, physicists are saying it's over, space time is doomed and reductionism is dead. And, and once again, the problem is that as you try to make these measurements, you create black holes. So the, the very fabric of space-time ceases to even make sense. Well, I've been studying this same question about space-time and objects and asking, are they fundamental from the point of view of evolution by natural selection? And, and the question that I've been asking with my colleagues um, is a very technical and specific question. Um, does evolution, shape sensory systems to show truths about objective reality, right? So we have this, fear, this theory of evolution in which, that, in which we assume that that must be the case, right? The intuition we have is that those of our ancestors who saw objective reality more accurately would have a competitive advantage um, in the major activities of life uh, feeding, fighting, fleeing, and mating. And, and so those who saw more accurately would more likely pass on their genes to the next generation um, that coded for the more accurate perceptions. And so we can be confident that after thousands of generations of this kind of thing, um, we are the offspring of those who saw reality more accurately. And so in the normal case, we, we are having accurate and true perceptions. Now, no one claims that we see all of reality. You know, we have a narrow range of colors that we can see and, and, and so forth. Uh, I can't see the, the, the backside of the moon, things like that. But the idea is that we have evolved to see accurately those aspects of reality that are critical for us to survive in our niche. So that's, that's the belief that we have in space and time and physical objects, then at least everyday middle-sized physical objects, 
are uh, a true representation of, of reality as it is. So, but this is the a technical question. Does natural selection favor vertical perceptions, the perceptions which at least uh, show us some aspects of the true structure of objective reality? And um, you, you might say, of course, I'll just mention that Steve Pinker in a wonderful paper in 2005 uh, titled, So How Does the Mind Work? offers just a couple examples of where evolution leads us not to have true perceptions. So he, he points out, um, and, and this is widely understood by evolutionary um, psychologists, that it does cost time and energy to compute the truth. And so we tend to try to take shortcuts because you know, um, time and energy are important. Everything, every calorie you spend on computing truth, you have to go out and kill something and eat it to get those calories. So there are selection pressures to do things on the cheap. Um, we sometimes need to have um, um, prior assumptions about uh, what's going on in the world, you know, like if we're Bayesians, and we could have fallible priors. Um, there are social pressures to conform to the ideas of a, of a, of a group, to, to, to be accepted into a group. Um, we might even want to show off now and then and, and uh, come up with uh, exotic beliefs just to show off how smart we are, even if they're not true. And one of the most interesting is that as a species, um, hunter-gatherer species, we, we, it was helpful for us to cooperate. If I went out and hunted and didn't get anything, but my friend Joe got something, uh, he, he brought down some kind of uh, antelope and I didn't, I could ask Joe, say, could I have some of yours tonight? And then tomorrow I'll give you some of mine. And if we cooperate that way, that's, that's actually a very fit strategy for everybody. Um, but it turns out if you do the analysis, what Robert Trivers pointed out, um, if everybody's cooperating and going out and hunting and gathering, someone who wants to be lazy and just uh, cheat, you know, just go out, sit under a tree by the river and, and enjoy themselves and then come back and say, I tried my best, couldn't get anything. That's actually a very fit strategy because you're not, you're not uh, putting yourself on the line. You're not risking your life. So if, if uh, you know, everybody's cooperating, a, a, a deceiver who, who lies, um, and says, I tried, but I didn't get anything, is actually more fit. That's a more fit strategy than, um, than the rest. Well, of course, if everybody is cheating, then the whole thing falls down because no one's bringing home any food. So at some point, um, this is called frequency dependent selection. At some point, if there's too many cheaters, uh, the whole thing will fall apart. So for the thing not to fall apart, um, what's gonna have to happen is that the, the cooperators are gonna have to figure out when someone's cheating, they'll have to de detect the cheaters. But then the cheaters might start to get better at cheating. And so you get this arms race where people are getting better at cheating, where people are getting better at detecting cheating. And what Trivers points out is uh, eventually who's, who's the best cheater? Who's the best deceiver? It's someone who is self-deceived. You don't even know that you're lying. That way you don't even betray with you know, blush or shifting eyes. That, that you're lying. So, so there are selection pressures for us uh, not to see the truth, even about ourselves and our own motives. So, so there is precedent for the idea that selection pressures could lead us um, to have false beliefs, um, even about our, our inner life. Well, so the technical question that I'm asking is, then is, um, what about our perceptions? Does natural selection shape sensory systems to see truths about objective reality, about the world around you? What is the probability that, that natural selection would do that? And it turns out, you, you might say you, you can't even ask that question in the theory of evolution of natural selection because Darwin's theory assumes that there are things like organisms, there are things like food and, and, and predators and prey, and these are all physical objects, and these are real physical objects, so you know, I mean, to ask whether objects in space-time is fundamental reality is silly because evolution by natural selection already assumes that. Well, it turns out in the 1970s, John Maynard Smith used the tools of game theory to actually take Darwin's theory and turn it into a mathematically precise theory. We have now what's called evolutionary game theory, evolutionary graph theory, and, and, and so forth. And, and so the nice thing about what John Maynard Smith did is he got rid of all the peripheral assumptions and just got the algorithmic core of evolutionary theory. It's of strategies that are competing with each other and, for, for, and they're competing for fitness payoffs. 
And there's an equation that I, I won't go into now, but there's this replicator equation and so forth. Um, but uh, what I want to talk about in particular are the fitness payoffs. And the, those are critical to understanding how evolutionary theory works. So just intuitively, um, if you're a lion looking to eat a T-bone steak, would offer lots of fitness payoffs. If you're that same lion looking to mate, that steak offers no fitness payoffs for you at all. And if you're a rabbit or a, or a cow, um, pretty much for any state of the rabbit or cow in any action, a T-bone steak is not going to offer fitness payoffs. So fitness payoffs are functions of whatever objective reality might be. Plus, they depend on the organism, like the lion versus the rabbit versus the cow, its state, hungry versus uh, full, uh, and its action, feeding, fighting, fleeing, and mating. So, so these fitness payoffs are really complicated functions of all those factors. And you can, you can think of them as like um, points that you might get in a game. If you're playing a, a, a video game, you, to get to the next level, you have to be getting points as quickly as you can. Um, um, without getting killed in the game if you want to go to the next level. And you can think of evolution that way. You're, you're, you're getting fitness payoffs, and if you get more fitness payoffs than, the, than your competition, then you're, you won't go to the next level of, of the game, but you're more likely to pass on your genes to your offspring who will go to the next stage of the game. So that's sort of the idea. And, but of course, there's a lot of technical stuff about evolutionary game theory that we can go into. Um, so it turns out, when you do the analysis with um, evolutionary game theory, both in the simulations of so some of my graduate students, Justin Mark and Brian Marion did um, genetic algorithm and other simulations, and then work with my, my mathematical colleague, Chaitan Prakash and Nish Singh and others, um, we have both the simulations and a theorem that basically says the probability that any sensory system of any organism has been shaped ever to see any aspect of objective reality is precisely zero. There's, there's basically the, the, that it doesn't mean it can't happen. Things that are probability zero can happen, but, but you would bet against them. So the probability of zero that any of our perceptions of, of objects, colors, shapes um, in space and time, any of our perceptions um, are a veridical representation of any aspect of the structure of reality. That's under the assumption that our senses evolved um, and were shaped by natural selection. So what we find is this stunning agreement between the two pillars, the theoretical pillars of modern science, quantum field theory on the one hand and evolution by natural selection on the other. Both pillars of our science are telling us space time is doomed and with it the methodology of reductionism. And that's, that's a stunning result. Um, and it's going to take a while for the sciences, especially, um, um, for example, our science, uh, cognitive neuroscience, to really grapple with this and take it into account and, and start to rethink how we're doing our research. So if a natural question comes up, okay, if, if space-time is doomed, if our senses were shaped by natural selection not to show us the truth, then, you know, what are they doing? What are, how shall we think about our senses? If they're, not, if they're not showing us the truth, what good are they? And the idea is that what evolution has done is, is give us essentially a, a virtual reality headset. Um, it, or you could think of it as, you know, it's like a virtual reality game that, that we're playing. Suppose that you're playing a, a, a racing, a, a race car game and, and off to your right, you see a, a red Mustang uh, when you turn your headset to the right and when you turn the headset to the left, you see, uh, you know, a, a, a white Porsche. Uh, well, seeing that red Mustang and seeing the steering wheel in front of you is very, very useful for playing the game. But of course, that's not the reality that you're interacting with. When you're playing, when you turn the steering wheel and you start to move, to, say, toward the, the red Mustang, um, you might think that the red, that the steering wheel caused your, your motion toward the, the red Mustang. But of course, that's just a useful illusion. The steering wheel itself in the VR is, is just something that you create when you look at the, at the, you know, turn your headset in the right direction. And the car that you see, the red Mustang, is also just something that you create. There is no red you know, Mustang in the supercomputer 
um, that's that's running the whole VR simulation or the whole game. So in this metaphor, the the world of cars and, and, and steering wheels and so forth is the VR illusion that you're using, but it's a useful illusion to control the reality of the circuits and software and, and diodes and electrodes in, in some supercomputer somewhere. If you had to control the voltages in that supercomputer to play the game, you wouldn't be able to play the game. And that's the point. Evolution gave us, the evolution gave us senses that were shaped to keep us alive long enough to reproduce, full stop, that's it. The way it does that is to hide the truth, you don't need the truth, and give you simple user interface to let you control the truth, even though you're, you're completely ignorant about the ultimate nature of that truth. So space-time and objects in space-time, according to quantum field theory and according to evolution by natural selection, are merely a convenient fiction that allow us to interact with objective reality, whatever it might be, um, but they hide the truth. We don't need to know the truth to stay alive long enough to reproduce. So just like when you see, you might see a, a, tr a triangle, or I'm sorry, a, a, a pyramid uh, on the screen. And if you look at the pyramid, the, the, the vertex in the middle may sometimes be pointing towards you and sometimes pointing away from you. Right? And if I asked you, um, when you look away, um, which, which pyramid is there? Is the pyramid that with the, the middle uh, vertex pointing towards you, or is it the pyramid in which the middle vertex is pointing away from you? Well, the answer is um, there is no answer because there is no pyramid when you're not looking. When you look at the screen, you create the pyramid and, and you, your perception creates whether it's you know, the, the middle vertex is pointing towards you or away from you. And, and the same thing is true about the sun and the moon and the Mount Everest and everything else. Those things um, exist, like the pyramid here exists, only when you look and when you create them. They're part of your virtual reality. They're not part of objective reality. They're just useful um, data structures that you create as you need them, and then you garbage collect them when you don't need them. So space-time is a data structure. Objects in space-time are data structures. They're not there to show us the truth. They're there to hide the truth, which is far more complicated, and you don't need to know the truth. Another metaphor, because this is so crazy, um, the desktop interface on your computer. If you're writing uh, your senior thesis or, or you know, your dissertation, and the icon for your file is blue and rectangular in the lower right corner of your screen, does that mean that your thesis or your book itself is um, uh, uh, blue and rectangular in the, the lower right corner of your computer? Uh, of course not. Anybody who thought that mis misunderstands the point of the interface is not there to show you the truth. It's there to hide the truth, all the circuits and software in your computer, and just give you simple eye candy to let you control the computer, even though you're completely ignorant about the details of that, how the computer works. And so that's what evolution has done for us. Couple objections, you know, Hoffman, if you think that train coming down the tracks at 200 miles an hour is uh, just an icon in your interface, why don't you step in front of it? And after you're dead and your theory with you, we'll know that the train was real and it really can kill. And I wouldn't step in front of the train for the same reason that I wouldn't carelessly drag this icon to the trash. Um, not because I take the icon, literally my, my, my file is not blue and rectangular, but I do take, do take that icon seriously. If I drag this icon to the trash, I could lose a year of work. So our perceptions evolved by natural selection to keep us alive. We must take them seriously if you, if, you, if you want to stay alive. If you see a snake, don't grab it. If you see a cliff, don't jump off. But the fact that we must take our perceptions seriously does not permit us logically to conclude that we must therefore take them literally. That's a logical error. Just because we must take them seriously does not entail that we must take them um, literally. And it's in fact, according to our best science, quantum field theory and evolution by natural selection is simply false that we should take our perceptions of objects in space time literally. Another objection, uh, there's nothing new here. Uh, you know. The physicists since Rutherford have told us that uh, yeah, we're not seeing the train really correctly. It's, 
that train looks solid and it's really um, hard metal. It looks that way to us, but but according to Rutherford, it's mostly empty space and uh, there's little tiny particles uh, moving at fast speeds um, in that tiny space. And so, yeah, we don't see reality as it is. You're not saying anything that uh, the physicists haven't been saying uh, for a long time. And um, I'm saying something very, very different than Rutherford. What, what Rutherford, that, that crit critique would be like saying, look, I know that this blue icon on the screen isn't the truth, but if I get out a magnifying glass and look really closely, I'll see pixels. And yeah, those pixels, that's the truth, um, even though the blue icon is not. Well, no, you're still on the desktop. You're still, you're not looking behind the desktop. You're still on, on the interface. And that's the same thing um, with the, the particles in space and time. Space time itself is just a desktop. It's just a data structure. The particles in space time are just data structures. So I'm saying something far deeper than, than that Rutherford kind of idea. And that's what the, the, the physicists themselves in the last 20 years have been saying when they say space time is doomed, they're saying something really profound. Space time itself is not a fundamental data structure, much less the particles in space time. Uh, one, one last objection. Well, look, we all see the train. We all agree that we see a train, therefore there must be a train. I mean, if we're, if we're all agreeing, how can we all agree unless there was really a train there? Well, we all agree that we see a pyramid, um, but, that's be, but there is no pyramid there. This is just a flat image. There, there's no three-dimensional pyramid. So we all see a pyramid because we all have the same software uh, that, that's constructing uh, the, the same um, data structure. So we construct the same data structures. That's why we agree. But just because we have a similar interface doesn't mean that the interface is true. It just means that we have similar interfaces and so we can communicate. So when it comes to the question of consciousness, then um, our best theories, quantum field theory and evolution by natural selection tell us that um, we should not start with particles in space time. The reductionist approach is dead. Uh, and the reason is that those particles don't even exist when they're not perceived. Right? These are data structures that you create on the fly and then garbage collect when you don't need them. So to be very, very clear, neurons are wonderful data structures that we create when we look inside of, of, of skulls. Neurons do not exist when they're not perceived. I'm all for neuroscience. I'm, I've done fMRI studies and EEG. I'm, I'm all for it. But, and this is not bad for neuroscience. What I'm saying is, uh, neuroscience is going to have to get a lot more funding. Neuroscience needs a lot more funding because it's going to be far more complicated than we thought. We thought we look inside brains, we see neurons and synapses and so forth, and that's what we've got. Well, no, that's not what we've got. We've got, those are data structures. We have to reverse engineer them and figure out what it is in reality um, that's causing us to have perceptions of neurons and synapses and, and, and networks and so forth. So when it comes to the issue of consciousness, um, it may be that we need to start with a theory, and I, I'm not saying this is the way we have to go, but this is the way I'm now looking at things. I'm starting uh, to propose a mathematical theory of consciousness and then ask, can we start with a theory of consciousness and then boot up space, time, and physical objects as data structures in, um, in consciousness? So in this, in this, this is just a side point because you might ask what, what, what might reality be? And that would be a completely different talk for me to go into that. So I'm just sketching it and then I'll move on. So I've got this mathematical model and um, I'll, at the end, I'll point you to some papers if you're interested where you wanna see the math um, of the networks of interacting conscious agents where they're all precisely defined. And it's, it's basically network information theory. That's um, the, the mathematics that's needed to understand um, this model of consciousness and its properties. And the idea is that if we have this vast network of interacting conscious agents, and um, so, some conscious agents um, use a user interface to interact with other conscious agents, and it's the interface of space and time. So physics, space, time, and physics is merely a, a data structure, a user interface that some conscious agents use to interact with other conscious agents. Uh, um, Brief question, you know, if consciousness is fundamental, what is it up? What is it up to? What is consciousness doing and why? Um, I don't know. Um, th there's only one idea that I've seen that's deep enough to be potentially interesting, and it comes from Gödel's incompleteness theorem. 
And, and basically, without going into the details, Gödel's incompleteness theorem basically tells us there's no end to the exploration of mathematical structure. No matter how much you explore mathematical structure, um, you will have always just scratched the surface of what's to be explored. And if consciousness is all there is, then the only thing mathematical structure could be about is conscious, the varieties of consciousness and its experiences. And so maybe what consciousness is up to is exploring all of its possibilities. And uh, Gödel's incompleteness theorem tells us that uh, that exploration is in principle unending. And so that's what consciousness is up to. I don't know if that's right, but it's, it's at least deep enough to be interesting. And what about time, right? So, uh, you know, time is a, a critical aspect of all of our lives. And so how do we, how would we get time emerging from a theory of consciousness? And, and, it, and also, you know, time is, is central in our whole story of a, of a big bang, um, it, the, high energy at the start and then eventually worlds form like the earth and then then plants and animals and so forth and then maybe there's going to be a big crunch or a, a big freeze and the whole thing will eventually end so time seems to be a critical aspect of our of our whole story and how, how would that emerge and, and it turns out you can have a theory of these conscious agents that's timeless in the sense that there's no entropic time um so it's a, it's a stationary markovian process but but if any perspective on it if you take any conditional per probability perspective on that dynamics, then you will induce an uh, increasing entropy. So part of the whole dynamical system will be to have a dynamics of consciousness in which perhaps time itself is not fundamental, but any perspective on that dynamics that any particular conscious agent might take will introduce time as an artifact of the projection. And with that limited resource of time, you will get all these other limited resources, and then you will have the theory of evolution by natural selection appearing as an artifact of a deeper dynamics, which in which there may not be competition at all. Well, I'm just sketching briefly the kinds of ideas that you have to explore. Um, so when you look at your face in the mirror, um, what you see is just skin, hair, and eyes, but you know firsthand that um, what you can't see, you're your hopes, your dreams, your aspirations, your love of music, and so forth, um, is it, it, it is something that's not even seen on your face. It, it's a whole world of, of experiences that that is hidden by your face. But your face, in some sense, is a portal. People can get a window, well, not a window, but but some insight into your mood and what you're experiencing through your face. Um, through so, human faces are a good portal. Um, my cat body is uh, you know, my cat's body is a less of a portal i have some insight into its consciousness but but not as much you know a mouse even less and at some point our you know there's the portal closes we have no insight into the consciousness that lies behind and and, and by the way i'm not saying for example that um any of these objects are conscious um the human body isn't conscious because the human body um is just a data structure so your body is is not you it's a data structure that you create when you when you look. So so physical bodies in space and time themselves have no consciousness. They're just lesser or better data structures for us to interact with other consciousnesses. So could AIs be conscious? Um, well, I have to rephrase the that question from the way it's typically thought of. The, the standard view is again a physicalist and reductionist view in which um, particles in space time are fundamental. If we get them working together in complicated enough ways, then maybe consciousness will emerge. Um, from, from my point of view, space time is doomed. That, that whole approach is doomed. Reductionism is dead. But we do know that our interface does give us portals into consciousness. I mean, your, your face is a portal. Um, and we know that there, we have one technology that allows us to build new portals. And that technology is having kids. Having kids is a way to open new portals. So once we understand our interface and we have a theory of what's beyond, and, and physicists are working on this, where right? they've got things called the cosmological polytope, the amplitohedron, the sociohedron. You can go, there's a, a lecture at, at course at Harvard in 2019 by Nima Arkani Hamed. And if you're interested in pursuing what the physicists are doing, you can go online. The YouTube course is, is available for free. You can just listen to his videos and find out why space time is doomed and all the amazing structures that are replacing space-time um, and that are doing amazing things uh, that, that you couldn't do in space-time. 
So once we understand uh, the structures beyond space time well enough, we may be able to open up new portals. And you know, who, who knows, we, we could open up perhaps new portals into consciousness and maybe the technology will look like artificial intelligence, but it won't be a reductionist approach to the whole thing. It will be um, a non-reductionist approach in which we're opening up new portals. So uh, with that, I'd just like to thank um, my, my many collaborators, um, my graduate students who ran the simulations and, and uh, others who've done a lot of the mathematics here. Um, and I'll just, for those who are interested in, in pursuing the details on this, I've got a paper called Objects of Consciousness with the mathematical theory of consciousness that I, I mentioned. Um, paper called Fact, Fiction, and Fitness, which has the theorem that the probability is zero, that uh, any organism will ever see any aspect of objective reality. Um, and then also another technical paper, Fitness Speaks Truth. So that's for those who are interested in, in pursuing it more, more deeply. And with that, if there's time, I would love to take questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Professor. Uh, I think we have about 10 minutes for questions. So Wonderful. Uh, we're just getting the mic set up here. Uh, we do have one in the chat already. Oh, oh I can't pull it up. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, okay. Does your conclusion that true perception has probability of probability zero of evolving take into consideration the fact that our perceptions appear to be largely consistent over very long periods of time. It seems like this imposes significant constraints on whatever the underlying structure can be. Right, well, so time is one of the big things that the physicists are looking at, right? So if you look, I mean, so the physicists are the ones who are saying space time is doomed, and that, that means time is doomed. And so they're, they found this structure called the cosmological polytope in which there is no time in general, but certain facets, certain projections of that polytope can give rise to um, what we would be the illusion of time. And, and that's why I, I mentioned that briefly in, in my theory of the dynamics of conscious agents, that once again, you can have a theory in which the fundamental reality is timeless um, in, in the sense that there's no increasing entropy in that dynamics. So there's no entropic time, but any projection of that dynamics is is will have an increasing entropy and therefore you will have this artificial entropic time as a result of projection so so that's the kind of so it's really hard for us to think out of the box right we've been stuck in this space-time interface um all of our lives and in fact our science has been stuck in it for centuries um, and it's been very successful now we have to actually think out of the box of space and time and that's that's a new trick for our species but, but if you look at what the, like Nima Arkani Hamed and these other guys are doing, it's a trick that we can do. We can actually start to find structures beyond space and time. So, so the fact that we have something that persists in time um, and, and is consistent over time is just part of the interface and perhaps an artifact of a particular kind of projection and, and, and in no way logically entails that we're seeing the truth. All right. Do we have any in-person questions? All righty then. Um, it looks like that is all the questions we have. Thank you so much, Professor Hoffman. Um, huh? Another, yeah, another round of applause. Okay.